I don't, my memory is very unclear about how the shredding incident started. I believe, as I said, my memory is that he began pulling documents and I joined him. And did you surmise that this was a, a way of trying to, to cover up something in conjunction with the Iran initiative or the Contra initiative? I don't use the word cover up. I would use the word protect. Why do you think we sold arms to Iran? Well, Iran, uh, well, for, to get the hostages out, strictly to get the hostages out. I think some people really believe that there were moderate elements there that might, you know, help us in the future. But I really think their main focus was uh, to free the hostages. They say it was to help the Contras in Nicaragua, but I don't believe that's true. It was to get the money, I believe. And that reason could be anything. They, I mean, they can tell us anything on TV. Iran is a crucial economic, geographic country. The U.S. wants to uh, get them friendly again as quickly as possible. Perhaps the most explosive issue that was not investigated in the hearings was the true nature of the arrangement with Iran. When did the U.S. actually begin selling weapons to Iran, and why? The most important thing to come out of the hearings is what didn't even get asked at the hearings, and that was Ronald Reagan cut a deal with Iran before the 1980 election to send arms to Iran in exchange for Iran's agreeing to delay the release of our 52 hostages. Barbara Honegger was a dedicated member of the Reagan-Bush presidential campaign in 1980, she worked on the special writing, research, and policy staff, and later as a White House policy analyst. As part of my position, I was required to cover the 11 o'clock evening news in the operations center. The campaign was afraid that Jimmy Carter would successfully bring the 52 hostages home, what we call the October surprise, and win the election. There had been a feeling of panic in the campaign. The 56 hostages taken captive at the U.S. Embassy in Iran in 1979 became a major issue in Jimmy Carter's campaign for re-election to a second term as president. His repeated efforts to gain their release failed, and Ronald Reagan was elected by a wide margin. After 14 months in captivity, the hostages were finally released, January 21st, 1981, the day of Ronald Reagan's inauguration. Now working as a private investigator, Barbara Honegger has researched the hostage question carefully. According to reports gathered from a number of sources, she has distilled the following information. There were two meetings that we know of for certain to date that happened, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Paris, France, before the 1980 election in October of 1980, where George Bush, then vice presidential candidate, Richard Allen, who became Reagan's first national security advisor, Donald Gregg, who became Bush's national security advisor and still is, passed millions of dollars to the Iranians to delay the release of our 52 hostages an additional 76 days. They met with an emissary of the Khomeini regime who offered a deal that they thought Reagan and Bush could not refuse, and that was we will delay the release of the 52 hostages if you will promise us all the arms that we could possibly want in the war against Iraq once you become president of the United States. The man who was president of Iran during the hostage crisis was Abul Hassan Banisadr. He was later ousted in a coup and is now living in exile in Paris. Banisadr supports the charges that a deal was made with the Reagan-Bush campaign to delay the hostages' release. In a recent interview, he confirms that the Paris meeting took place and states that George Bush was specifically identified as being at the meeting by Iranian intelligence reports. Also identified were Moniker Gobanifar and Albert Hakim, who later emerged as key middlemen in the Iran-Contra scandal. As evidence of this agreement, Bani Sadr has made documents available showing written orders for shipment of American parts and weapons to Iran through an Israeli-owned company. And in fact, we now know that those arms began flowing in late February, early March of 1981. Not as the White House would have you believe in 1985. I want to get to the bottom of this and find out all that has happened. And so far, I've told you 
all that I know, and you know the truth of the matter is, for quite some long time, all that you knew was what I told you. The bottom line is that the Iran-Contra Committee and the Walsh investigation, because their mandates only take us back to 1984, in and of themselves are a cover-up. But the problem of hostages did not go away for President Reagan. Radical elements in Middle Eastern countries continued to kidnap Americans during Reagan's term of office. We're going to continue to explore, as we always have, every opportunity to try and get them out. I happen to believe that when an American citizen, any place in the world, is unjustly denied their constitutional rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the responsibility of this government to restore those rights. One of the hostages taken in Lebanon in March 1984 was Jerry Levin. His wife, Sis Levin, became increasingly frustrated with Reagan's lack of action to gain her husband's release. The word sent to the hostage families constantly was, he was too busy to even see us. We had no access. We had no task force. We had no hearings in Congress. All of those things were denied us. We were simply told to stay home, to be quiet, to trust, and the agenda will be fulfilled. Now we know the agenda was to Iran. After seven months, Sis Levin finally traveled to the Mideast to gain her husband's release. He was later allowed to escape as a result of her negotiations with the Syrian government. Thank you. It's wonderful to be back. Her experience has led her to doubt the Reagan administration's motives. The claim on the part of the government was that the administration was so anxious about the hostage situation that they were pressured into giving arms to the Ayatollah to bring the hostages out. Many of us think in looking at it that if there had not been hostages, they would have had to have been created. Because if the agenda to, to get arms to Iran were discovered, the only thing the American people would take as an excuse would be the very human element of a very human president weeping over hostages. The Reagan-Bush administration, right from the beginning, behind the scenes, has been an ally of the Khomeini regime because Ronald Reagan's number one fear is the Soviet invasion of Iran. It's that simple. I must confess to you that I thought using the Ayatollah's money to support the Nicaraguan resistance was a right idea. I was not the only one who was enthusiastic about this idea. Director Casey referred to, to it as the ultimate irony, uh, the ultimate covert operation. There was a lot of talk during the hearings about covert operations, national security, the necessity of secrecy in conducting foreign policy. But some experts claim that covert action does not work in the interest of the U.S. national security, nor does it create a more stable world. To think of the democratic governments that have been overthrown uh, in the last 30 years by military coups is almost like giving a capsule history of CIA covert operations in the last 30 years. I mean, there, there was the overthrow of Prime Minister Mossadegh in, uh, in Iran in 1953. There was the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. There was the um, overthrow of the Brazilian government in 1964. There was the overthrow of the Ghana government in 1966. A lot of the governments I just mentioned got into trouble with the international oil companies because they tried to assert their national prerogatives over their own resources. Time after time, the CIA has come in on behalf of those multinational companies. <laughs>